I remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, you could draw a line going from Galway to Dublin, and south of that line there were no literary journals being published and produced. <coughs> and I remember Thomas McCarthy at the time saying that a major city needs its own literary journal the way it needs its own art gallery. Um, you need a journal to curate a region's writers. Um, quarrymen have been going most of um, the last century as a student journal, um, general student journal in, in UCC. Uh, it published the occasional piece of creative writing. It would have published some of the early poems of Eleni Quillanon and short stories by Sean Lucy when he was a, an undergraduate. Um, and then it kind of petered out um, in the late 60s. And it was revived again purely as a literary journal by the, the Cork poet Greg Delante in the early 80s. Uh, Greg's father worked in printing, so Greg had an insight into uh, the printing process in its far more complicated pre-digital days, and he had an appreciation of paper and design and typography, and he, he brought back Quarryman as a quarto publication in the early 80s, very beautiful production, um, and it was funded uh, through the offices of the Students' Union at the time and uh, went for about four or five years and then petered out again and was finally revived about two or three years ago by the School of English. But it's now again, as far as I know, uh, a journal run and managed completely by the student body again. And um, uh, kudos to them because it's, it's a beautiful journal. And as we can see from the lineup of writers we're going to present to you here, uh, today, it's 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 a, a journal of quality, both in in its writing and in its uh, production standards. So we're going to take four writers in alphabetical order. Conal Creedon is a literary polymath. He's published a collection of short stories, a novel, uh, a trilogy of plays. He has written for television and radio. All of last year, he was a writer in residence at UCC, and just recently, he's been appointed an adjunct lecturer. Uh, so, would you please welcome Conal to start our reading today? Professor. Adjunct professor. See, I know, I knew that's the term in the in, in America, and oh, it's, it's English in England that they're adjunct ab, 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 abject, ad, ad, <laughs> adjunct adjunct lecturers. Okay. <laughs> it's nice to be called a polymat rather than just being a mat. Um, anyway, listen, I'm going to run with this just to say because uh, Pat did mention the right in residence last year, and you see, and it honestly, like in my working life, and I've worked in lots of different things, including the gas company and my own business and that kind of thing, but in my working life, it was the best working year I ever experienced. It was just really a lot of fun, you know? And I think when when your workplace becomes fun, it means something is right, you know? And and then, the, alluding to the second thing that Pat mentioned, that's honestly, you know, I would say definitely the nicest thing in the workplace that has ever, I suppose, happened to me, really, and very much appreciated by the people up there who decided to do it. Anyway, I'm gonna read this very briefly. <clears throat> I don't do birthdays, New Year's, Valentine's, Halloween, but I do Christmas. I love Christmas, and so I constantly keep writing about it for some reason. And uh, so that's what this is about, really, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> it's the darkness before dawn this Christmas Eve morn. All the world's at peace, not a soul scurrying through the streets, no movement along the quays, nothing stirring. The only sign of light is the odd flicker of life from the houses way up on the north side. The only interruption to my thoughts is the rhythmical sound of a squeaking wheel far away in the distance. Christmas? Funny time years, Christmas. 
It's an effort to put the head spinning and the mind to do somersaults. It's a time when bygones become bygones and those dead and gone are remembered. It's a time when the pain of loneliness finds comfort in simple things like candles and fairy lights or the lonesome sound of Shreem McGowan singing of drunken fairy tale nights. It's a time when the mind wanders to when everything was happy, sweet and innocent in the world. It's a time when the myths of childhood become truths and the magic of belief is restored. And I suppose that's it. Christmas is a time of belief. Woke up this morning, thrown down on the couch, head splitting in a daze. Your man on the radio talking about the weather. He's saying water levels are rising, been raining for days. So we can expect flooding in low-lying areas. I hand you over to Mara from the wet office to hear what the weatherman has to say. Or should that be a weather woman or weather person? Nothing particularly funny about what he has just said, but he laughs anyway. Ah, well, Mara, says he, are we dreaming of a wet Christmas this year? He sings through bars of a song. I'm dreaming of a wet Christmas. Maura from the Met Office is dry as dust. She's babbling on about isobars and millibars. She's spouting on about precipitation, hydrometers, and atmospheric pressure. She says, the high pressure belt coming up from the Azores will interfere with the low pressure coming across over Europe, and that might cause a warm front to move in up over the country. So, Maura, in layman's language, or should that be laywoman's language, layperson's language, he laughs again. Haha, <laughs> uh, can we expect a wet Christmas or a white Christmas? Wet, says Maura, very wet. And there I was, stretched out on the couch, head hopping off me. See. That's the problem with this country. I mean, Jesus, there's Maura from the Met Office, a fully educated and qualified meteorologist, and she doesn't, if you don't mind, and she's telling me that it's going to be wet. For Christ's sake, you know, there's a John Balls, the right man out there talking about the weather. Anyone with two brains rubbed together could stick their head out the window and tell you if it's raining, and if it's wet, and if it's dry, it's not. So there you have it. From the horse's mouth, folks, or should I say the filly or the mare's mouth, haha, <laughs> it's going to be a wet Christmas. But don't touch that dial, the sun is always shining here in City Sounds FM, and here bringing a few drops of sunshine into your day is Shwadi Wadi. <laughs> hey, Mr. Christmas, we hope you're having fun. And I'm throwing down the couch, and the head is lifting off me, and there's Joan standing over me, the big red head in her, and she's spitting fire and stamping on her feet, pointing to the bulge in her belly, and she's shouting, and what about this? What about this? The baby is doing anything to know. Do you even understand the meaning of responsibility? Responsibility. Do you understand what I'm saying? Responsibility. And I'm lying there on the couch. My brain is in motion. I'm listening to this. I mean, Jesus, I'm 51 years of age. This was not part of the plan. Not part of the plan at all, at all. Like, when I met Joan, this was not part of the plan. Do you, she shouts, do you? Do you even understand the meaning of responsibility? Jesus, what is it about Christmas? Joan hissing and spitting and throwing a fit, and me lying there in the eyes closed, thinking to myself, how does it get to this point? How do two people fall totally head over heels in hate for each other? There I was, clung to the couch, in bits, crying out for a salpidine, herself like a lunatic, and me trying to make sense of all, trying to save what little we had. Look, says I, when I met you, there was never any talk of having a baby. This was not part of the plan. Well, Jesus, part of the plan, now she snapped, and you better wake up and smell the coffee. I'm 51 years of age, for Christ's sake. I'll be 70 when the child is 20. I'm too old to be having no baby. You weren't too old to be chased me around the bedroom with your tongue hanging out, and that wasn't the only thing hanging out. But this was never about having babies, Joan. Not about having babies. But what was it about? A good question. A simple question. And like most simple questions, it didn't have a simple answer. But I suppose it was about a lot of things. Too many things. Things far too complicated for my brain to even begin to untangle. Like, why was this beautiful young girl wasting her time with me? Or more to the point, what was I doing shacking up with this young one half my age? What was it all about? She says it again. Joan is glaring down at me like, like I had all the answers. So I gave her the first answer that entered my brain. Um, sex, says I. That's when I realised that a small world very seldom explains a complicated situation and it was a big mistake. Sex? Sex? Is that what this is all about to you? We've been together for three years, Christy. I dropped out of college for you and now you're telling me it was all about sex. Well, well no, that's not exactly what I mean. I mean, you know what's killing about all this, she says. I now realise my mother was right all the time. From the very beginning, she was right when she said, you're nothing but a dirty old man who saw a good thing and a young thing. I hold it now, don't hold it. You know I love you. I do love you. I've always loved you. I love you since the first time. Jesus, John, we love each other. We did, like, we did love each other. Like, where's the magic gone? Magic? The magic is in there, boy, she says, pointing to her belly. Yeah, but, but, but... Sorry. 
But before all that, Joel, what about the fairy tale? What happened to fairy tale? Fairy tale? God almighty, John, you were Red Riding Hood. I was the woodcutter. You were Cinderella. I was Prince Charming. Prince Charming? You were Snow White. I was, yeah, well, if I'm Snow White, you're fucking dopey, she shouts. <laughs> enough is enough. Too much. Ah, for Christ's sake, Joan, there must be something. Too little, too little. Well, fuck you, says I. I head for the hall door. You just keep on walking. I'll be back for my stuff. Stuff? She said, what stuff? You speak shag off when I first met you. I could have told you about stuff. Stuff that I brought this relationship. Stuff you can't hang in the wardrobe or hang in the shelf. I could have told you about stuff, but Jesus, there comes a time, and this was now the time, to go, and I had to go. I had to get out of there. It was better for me, better for Joan, better for the child to be. Fuck you, I shout, and slammed the front door behind me. Fuck you. Two little words. It's like after all these months of being a good boy, saying nothing, acting dumb, twiddling my thumbs, putting up with her and her mood swings, just to have to turn around once and fall and tell her straight to her face to go fuck herself. It was like a weight off my shoulders. And just in case she didn't get the message first time round, I lifted the letterbox lid and rode in the hallway. Fuck you. Letterbox lid snapped shut and that feels good. The sound of the squeaking wheel has stopped and that's when I notice the street sweeper. He's standing there beside me, leaning on his wheelie dumper. He raises his thumb in the air and kisses the words, respect. <laughs> respect for a street sweeper, now that's something. Everyone knows that street sweepers in this town are gods and gods don't give respect lightly. Then I see the Chinese one from number three across the street. She's standing there, key in the door, mouth open, staring at the space, acting like she's seen and heard nothing. Funny, funny, but I've always fancied the Chinese one from number three across the street. <laughs> It's got to do with the whole East meets West thing, a journey into the unknown, a taste of the exotic. Like, I don't know her very well. In fact, I don't know her all at all. She's the kind of girl who keeps herself to herself, and maybe that's what I find so attractive. I mean, like, I know her to see. I see her in the Golden Dragon if I buy takeaway. She's a friendly sort of girl, quiet, mannerly, maybe a little bit shy. But then again, you'd expect that from the Chinese. But sometimes at night time, when I'm lying in bed next to Joan, and the lights are low, and Joan is reading her book, and I'm looking at the ceiling, Bored to death, I sometimes wonder what it might be like to go naked with the Chinese one from number three across the street. And maybe she has never noticed me before now, but at this moment, as I stand here on my doorstep, barking loudest, telling Joan to go fuck herself, the Chinese one from number three across the street can be no doubt, but that I am the man. I am the man, and it feels good. It's a bit like, like, bit by bit, Joan was chipping away at me until eventually I was like a castrated dog, licking me whole, wondering where my balls were gone. And I can take no more of it. I'm sick of central heating. I'm sick of weather glaze, sick of the couch, sick of still of sitting it. I'm sick of curtains, tea and grocery shopping. I'm sick of talking about babies, clothes, prams and nursery rooms. And as sure as Christ, I'm sick to death of Joan. So I turn my collar to the cold and walk away down McSweeney Street and into town. That's when I realise... My cigarettes are exactly where I left them the night before, next to the couch on the floor. Ah, Jesus. The wallet, the keys, the phone are there too. Two steps backwards, whisper through the letterbox, psst, Joan, Joan. <laughs> Open the door, will you? I give a gentle tap. Psst, Joan. Street sweeper on my right hand, the Chinese one from number three across the street, standing behind me. I'm bent over, whispering through the letterbox, trying to attract Joan's attention without attracting attention to my Psst, Joan. Open the door, will you, Joan? The street sweeper steps up. Are you locked out, says he? <laughs> I just look at him and say nothing. Uh, do you have a spare key, says he? If I had a spare key, I wouldn't be knocking on the fucking door, would I? Jeez, <laughs> uh, you need a spare key, says he. I mean, every time I get a new lock, I run off a couple of spare keys. You can never have too many spare keys, believe it or not. But I know a man who locked himself into his own car. Can you imagine that? Being locked into his own car, that's somehow you do all the same. <laughs> Next thing I know, the street sweeper is telling me all about it. Locked into his own car he was, and if that wasn't bad enough, it happened on the very morning of his wife's funeral. The street sweeper is telling me that his, this man's wife was out power walking, trying to lose a few stone for her daughter's wedding. She was pounding along the matter road, doing 10 miles an hour. She comes flying around the bend and plows straight into a truck, coming the opposite direction, doing seven and when a woman doing 10 miles or going that way connects with a truck doing 70 miles or coming that way, there's only one outcome. Made total shit for her. Made absolute and total shit for her. That's the same as hitting a brick wall doing 80, he says. The truck driver didn't even know he connected with her until he stopped for a petrol up in, or a diesel up in Charleville. There he was walking around the front of the truck and he saw what looked like a bit of stuffing out of a mattress and a bit of cloth clung to the bumper. He puts his fingers on the mattress stuffing. It feels like hair. It was only then that he noticed a spray of blood and guts along the side of the truck. Then he realised it was the poor woman's scalp that was dangling there. The first thing the truck driver felt was something turning in his stomach. 
And that's when it started. First past his gullet was the full Irish he'd gobbled down about a half an hour earlier, a milky stew of sausages, rashes, black pudding, beans, fried eggs and tomatoes, all swimming in a pot of tea. Oh, God. He managed to straighten himself up, and just before the next surge of orange juice and cornflakes, I mean, Jesus. He tried not to think of the woman's scalp dangling there and it dripping beads of brain to the road, but didn't his stomach turn again, stirring the takeaway he scoffed on the way home from the pub the previous night, a mismatch of uh, fish and chips, mushy peas, a carton of curry sauce and a pint of milk. Then one after another, eight pints of beamish, followed by two round black chasers, splashed out in splurts, washing the tarmac, and there kneeling in the middle of the forecourt of the petrol station up in Charleville, the full menu of his previous 24 hours came up course after course in the reverse order they went down. They say he never drove, drove a truck again in our flat. The guilt, you know the guilt. And you're not going to believe this, but the truck driver was an uncle of the lad marrying the dead woman's daughter. Some fucking wedding that turned out to be. Now, I have enough in my mind this Christmas Eve morning to be standing here on the side of the street listening to the streets where he was rubbish. Joan is probably inside the hall door listening to all this, having right to laugh or said, but Jesus, there was no stopping him. Anyway, says the street sweeper, getting back to the fellow who locks into the car. Well, on the morning of the wife's funeral, he decides to drive his own car to the cathedral out of out of St. Finbar Cemetery. I suppose he did it to show his family and the in-laws that he was coping with the grief. You know, the grief, like, you know? Jeez, I don't know how the man held it together at all. I mean, I mean, there was scraping up bits of the wife's body from miles along the road just to have something to put into the coffin. And when he had all the bits and pieces of the dead woman gathered together, they weighed her remains. She was only nine stone. That's four stone lighter than before she was hit by the truck. Someone said that her soul had left her body at the moment of impact and went straight to heaven. But Christ Almighty, who ever heard of a soul that weighed four stone? And fair juice to the undertakers, didn't they send out their men to search the hedgerows and gullies along the side of the road for the missing four stone? But no luck. It was like it just vanished. Vanished into thin air. And that can happen, you know. I was watching a scientific channel the other night and they were saying that in certain circumstances and conditions, matter can just be turned into energy. And I'd say that's what happened. It's like when the truck connected with a 13 stone bulk, the sheer fright of it just made four, so four stone of her vanished in a puff of energy. Puff, just like that. But that didn't stop the lads from the funeral parlour searching for the missing four stone. Oh no, didn't they scrape up bits of piece of dead hedgehogs, rabbits, badgers and vermin they found on the road just to put into the coffin, just to make up the weight. And I don't know whether I'm listening to all this. I mean, I need to get back into the house for the cigarettes, keys, wallet and phone. So I turned my back to the street sweeper and whispered to the box, Joan, Psst, Joan, please open the door with you, Joan. But the street sweeper still chunting on about the fellow locks himself into the door, or into the car and drink it. He's doing me head in. The only reason I'm standing here listening to this tripe is I don't want to be making a fuss trying to get back into my own house. The street sweeper swearing on his dead mother's soul that the story is true. After all, he heard it in the horse's mouth. It wasn't his own brother, the grave digger that day, he says. He stops to take a breath of air. Look, says I. Why don't you get back to your sweeping wherever you're doing? Ah, Shubman got me a time and he made plenty of it, says he. Well, right now, I don't have time, all right? He takes the hint and he steps back. I lean towards the door. Again, gentle tap, letterbox, and whisper, Joan, psst, open the door, will you, Joan? Upstairs window opens with a clatter. Joan leans out. Ah, there you are, says I. Why, what do you think I'd be, says she, in a sarky sort of way. Are you looking for something? Uh, my cigarettes, uh, wallet and phone, keys, they're uh, inside with a coach. Cigarettes, wallet and, fee, and, uh, and phone, she says. I notice she doesn't mention the keys. Uh, that's right, says I, my cigarettes, my wallet, and my phone. Um, and what's the special word? Special word, Joan? Yeah, the special word, says she. Uh, thanks, says I. That's when she corrects herself and says, well, actually, there's two special words. Two special words, Joan. Uh, thanks and, and sorry. Sorry and thanks, Joan. No, says she, in a childish way, not thanks and sorry. How about uh, sorry and thanks? No. She smiles, not sorry and thanks either. Joan is up there in the first floor window, towering over me like a cat with a mouse, just playing with me, the evil bitch, and she knows, she knows damn well that she has me exactly where she wants me. Please, Joan, just let me get me stuff, will you? Aha, uh -huh, says she, so you're back for your stuff. Joan, this isn't about stuff. Would you like to know what two special words are, she asks. I'm squirming there on the side of the footpath, totally exposed and vulnerable. So I just nod my head and say, I would, Joan. Well, says she, the two special words are, fuck you, and she slams the window shut. <laughs> Street sweeper is standing there waiting my next move. <laughs> I turn towards him, give him a sort of a half laugh, trying to pass the whole thing off as a bit of a joke. Again, the street sweeper 
raises Tom in defiance. Respect, says he. Yeah, right. Respect, says I. In my heart and soul, I know that this is not the best time for me to walk away. Christmas Eve and a baby on the way. Then again, it can never be the best time, only the right time. And there comes a time when enough is enough, too much is too much, and it's always too little too late. So like my father, and his father before him, I turned my collar to the cold and walked away. That's it. is a short story writer, a journalist, and a broadcaster in both radio and television. And he lives in Kinsale. Would you please give a welcome for Donna? I have uh, bad news to start with. I'm only uh, about 10% as funny as Conal. Um, so this is... <laughs> this is a... Uh, difficult act to follow. Um, William Trevor once said that uh, a novel should have a plot, but a short story have a, should have a point. Um, and most of my short stories, there's very little point to them at all. Um, this one, however, um, came along with a point, and almost a plot. And nobody was as surprised as I was when it, when it, when it came out. Um, I wrote it maybe about a year ago at this stage, um, and I've noticed one or two school uniforms in the in the audience, and I do apologise in advance for any blushes that uh, may come your way. But I think Conan has dropped the f bomb sufficiently to, uh, to to get you loosened up in that department. I'm not going to read the whole thing. This is a story about a priest, an Irish priest, priest from Cork, who is who's found himself as a young priest in Miami. <laughs> in 1975. Um, he's awkward in every capacity um, and he's just completely out of place and always has been. He's happy with awkward but few enough people are happy with his being awkward. His name was Cahill O'Flynn. Cahill left the house as quickly as he could and headed down Cali Ocho towards Coral Gables. The sun was starting to set and the city was soaked in a warm pink glow. Even in the middle of the city, those palm trees that were dancing softly now like windmills in the easy breeze. This section of the city was mostly Art Deco designs and the pastel blues and yellows softened in the evening light, making it look like it was a cartoon village made entirely from candy. The only person Cotton missed from home was his mother, and he would write to her every Sunday to try to explain the new world he was living in. Mostly his pen failed him. He couldn't explain the constant music, the smell of gar garlic and barbecued fish and coffee the intense heat and how hard it was to breathe even at night. It was difficult to describe how so many people could live so close together that you were never ever alone and yet times like this he felt most alone. Tears often coming as he would see his mother baking bread at the table and think he would never be that close to her again. Five years earlier when Cahill was being ordained he took three vows. One of poverty, one of obedience and one of chastity. The three vows were man-made, but the commitment was to live a simple, pure life dedicated to doing good things. The eldest child of a widowed mother in Cork in the 1950s, Cahill felt poverty, obedience and chastity would come naturally to him. And he was right. Poverty and obedience were easy in the church, and he knew for sure that he would never have sex with a woman. Cahill sat alone on the bus, his shirt sticking to the faux leather of the seat, his mouth as dry as peanuts. He pulled a piece of paper out of his pocket and discreetly read the address. Although he had read it so many times, he felt he could recite it. The Cactus Lounge, 2041 Biscayne Boulevard, Miami. The magazine the Cahill had found in the university claimed that there were 23 homosexual bars in Miami, 13 in the city and 10 out on the beach. Most of the city bars were to be found in the Powder Puff Patch, but that was too close to his parish, so Cahill had selected the Cactus Lounge. Cahill had his ear pressed against the window and he could hear himself breathing faster and faster and he had to remind himself that he had done nothing wrong yet. Probably wouldn't. Certainly not tonight. Tonight was only to reconnoiter. His left leg was jigging on the ball of his foot and he noticed his palms pressed together in an ironic position of prayer. He looked around the bus and imagined all the other passengers naked. 
men and women, young and old, but mostly men and mostly young. He found himself staring at a guy across the aisle. He'd been wearing denim jeans and a denim jacket and a tight white t-shirt. Now he was naked with a couple of books on his crotch. <laughs> he had a smooth tan body and two black nipples and a sparkling silver crucifix over his heart. He had a surf white smile and really kind eyes. He reached out a gentle hand. My name is James, come follow me. The big red and silver bus whooshed to the curb and Cahill took his head back to reality and clambered out, of the, out into the tar sticky heat. He was still a couple of blocks before the cactus lounge, but he was preparing his alibi already. How was he to know it was the homosexual bar? Anyone could make that mistake. The bar was cool and dark, but it was still too early, except for a few older customers. So Cahill found a seat by the bar as far from anyone as he could. In his mind, Cahill made two lists. The first list was the reasons why he shouldn't be here, top of which was a picture of his mother, then God, then all his classmates laughing at him, then the police arresting him, then the bishop praying for him, but overall just deep, deep shame. The second list had only one thing on it, the answer to a question he was asking himself since he was about six. Well, he thought, as he tore up list number one, he was about to find out. Once he had, to, once he had decided to do it, he had to decide what it was. He had heard that there was a code where guys wore different coloured handkerchiefs in their back pockets to show what preferences they had, but he didn't know his, even know his own preference, let alone what colour it was. Hey, my name is Simon, you're new here, one of the older guys from down the bar. Hi, I was walking past and I was really hot and I needed a drink and Cahill blurted out. Hey, hey, relax, Tiger, that's okay. It's your first time in a bar like this? I, I didn't know, I just came in, it was a mistake. All our first times are mistakes, honey. You'll be okay. Where's that cute accent from? I'm Irish. My name is Cahill. <coughs> Do not fear, Cahill. I am here to help. Silence. So, Cahill, to prefer to fuck or to be fucked. Even with Cahill's close relationship with Awkward, this was way too much. Excuse me, I need the bathroom, Cahill said, leaving. In the bathroom, he tried to control his panic and he stumbled into a toilet cubicle and locked it behind him. As he tried to focus his mind on how to get out, he noticed a small screen at waist level slid across, revealing a saucer-sized hole. A hairy, dark finger came through, beckoning him, and then replaced by a bearded open mouth, making sucking sounds like he was tasting wine. Cahill didn't stop to say goodbye. All the following week, Cahill felt like he had escaped from jail. He gave thanks to God for teaching him a lesson, and the next Tuesday, Cahill went to the movies. Jaws was playing, and the mania that was sweeping the nation was no different here in Miami. Cahill loved it. The hidden monster from the deep that Brody had to face, the community in denial, the misfits, Quinton Hooper, secure in their individuality, the bravery of dealing with your worst fears. It was nothing short of biblical. Walking home, Cahill realised that with a small diversion, he could easily walk past a number of men-only bars. Since his terrifying introduction to the Cactus Lounge, he had read more about the different bars. They all catered for different subgroups. The cactus he heard catered for chicken hawks and drag queens. The blue oyster took care of the bears, the cubs and the otters. The cross swords catered for the chubs and their followers. And bottoms up gave the twigs their home. Buoyed with the bravery of Chief Brody, Cahill strode into the bottoms up like any movie outsider saying to hell with the consequences a man's got to do what a man's got to do. Bottoms up was smaller and busier than the cactus the previous week. The walls were covered with pictures of Greek gods, the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Michelangelo's David. There was a small dance floor with funky music blaring and a disco ball throwing diamonds of coloured light around the room. The customers were mainly under 25, mainly Latin and mainly smoking. Youth and beauty hung on their cotton shirts like fresh aftershave, their movements emotional and dramatic like dancers. Carl was entranced. He had never felt more out of place, and yet so much at home. He was sitting between two groups of young guys and both chatted to him as if he had always been there, asking his opinion on music or movies or getting much different answers than they were used to. He became the funny, entertaining, academic type that relieved the boredom of the stereotype. He was attractive exactly because he provided a break from the tedium of Cobham beauty. <coughs> Cobb was about to leave when one of the guys puts his hand on his arm. Hey, why are you going so early? Stay, buy me a beer. 
Maybe another time I really need to go. My name is Santiago, the young man offered his hand. Carl. The shaking of hands lasted too long. It was much too much like holding hands. Can I walk with you, Colin? I don't think this is a very good idea. Well, can I see you again then? Uh, maybe. No, I don't think so. Maybe. That's a yes then. Santiago flashed the whitest of smiles. I might be here next week. <coughs> the following Saturday afternoon, Carl was visiting the neighborhood church of St. Rose of Lima, helping in the soup kitchen when he saw that, that confession was being heard. Carl's normal confessor was the spiritual guide, Father Doyle, from the diocese, but Carl had not spoken to him about his sexuality. This seemed like a good chance to share his load. Inside, in the dark, cool confessional, Carl dropped to his knees and waited for the window to slide across. He tried to get the toilets of the cactus lounge out of his mind. It was clear to Carl that he was close to committing a mortal sin. Was kissing another man a sin? Was touching another man a mortal sin? Was it enough to end his relationship with God? This is the academic side of Carl's brain, rationalizing his crime, discussing the theory of his actions. A small, suppressed corner of Carl's brain knew that the real question was how much of a sin it was to want to fuck the ass off a young Latin guy. The screen slid across. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's one week since my last confession. Go ahead, my son. Since then, I've been disobedient. I've treated my brothers with disrespect. I have. Carl paused. It's okay, go ahead. I've had impure thoughts, Father, about another man, Father. Have you acted upon them, my son? No, Father, but the temptation is great. Be careful, my son. Do not confuse sexual temptation with love. Love is the reason we're all here, and sex can distract from that. But if I fall, Father, is it a mortal sin? I don't think you can sin out of love, my son. Let us pray. Oh my God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended you. The following Tuesday, Cahill had sex for the first time. He met with Santiago in the bottoms up, and both knew immediately what they wanted to do. Do you have somewhere we can go, Cahill said hoarsely. Yes. Santiago's brother worked in a local hotel and had a key to the staff quarters. Cahill walked behind Santiago, but he felt everyone knew what they were doing. His heart was beating so loud he thought people were looking at him. <coughs> the sex was much simpler than he had expected. He thought there would be rules as to who did what and when, but there wasn't. It all just evolved. Santiago was very relaxed, and while well, clearly it wasn't his first time, his goal seemed to be to make Carl happy, and he was. The summer of 1975 was the summer of sex for Father Carl O'Flynn. Santiago was a good teacher and a good learner. He was happy to make Cahill happy and asked for very little. Cahill knew he was dirt poor and when he, would, when he could, he would give him some money for his family. In equal measures, Cahill was delighted and terrified to be falling in love for the first time. Late in that summer, Cahill celebrated a funeral mass for an elderly parishioner, Ernesto Bautista, had left Havana to fight in the, in, for the US in the Second World War and had never returned to Cuba. He started a small bakery in Miami called Daily Bread, and when he died, employed 25 people and had five vans delivering bread and pastry all over Miami. <coughs> His brother gave Cahill an envelope for the mass that contained a $100 bill. It was the first time that Cahill had ever seen a note of such value. That night, Cahill met with Santiago. He only had an hour, but he always felt good after meeting him. The church told him to hold his breath, and Santiago allowed him to ex exhale. Santiago was low tonight and it saddened Cahill. His father had left again, his brother had gotten his girlfriend pregnant and his mother was trying to raise the other six children with no money. On an impulse, Cahill passed him the envelope with the $100 bill. Don't open it now, just give it to your mother. I can't, this is your money. I got it today for the poor, I can think of no better cause. Thank you, Santiago whispered. His beautiful brown eyes threatened tears. Thank you. The following Monday was the first September it was the 1st of September, and Cahill sat at dinner, listening to Father Hernandez chattering on. He hadn't heard the doorbell when Rosita came in with two tall priests and was uncharacteristically nervous. Father Flynn, this is Monsignor Scully and Father Belmonte from the Bishop's Palace. Scully removed his hat, but not his black gabardine, turned and stared at Father Hernandez. Would you mind leaving us, Father? Cahill knew straight away he was in trouble. This was not a chat about his future. This was very serious. Father O'Flynn, Scully said, listen to me. Please do not speak. 
We have some information we have been investigating. Look, if this is about, I said be quiet, you have no idea how serious this is. You have two options, and you will have about 30 seconds to make up your mind. We have evidence that you've been having a relationship with a boy in the parish. Actually, he's only 14 years of age, so you haven't been having a relationship. You have been raping him. And you have been paying him for sex, stealing money from the church and giving it to your little boy, whore. Oh God, it's not like that. He's older, Colin found tears coming and his head spinning. It's precisely like that. You're a disgrace to your family, a disgrace to your parish, and a disgrace to your church. Really, I can explain everything. Carl had his head in his hands, his whole world falling apart. I don't want to hear it. No, Bishop Garcia is a generous man. If it was me, I'd be coming here with the police. The bishop wants to give you one more chance, but it means leaving here now, this minute. Fill a bag for overnight, and we'll send, send back for the rest of your stuff. But I can't leave. I have my work. I have. You will not see this place again. You will be sent for a few months on retreat to pray for your illness. And when you're in control again, you will be sent to a new parish far away. I'm not going. You can't make me. This is going to be quick. I would be very happy to go to the cops right now, very happy. You will be sent to jail. You will be thrown out of the church. Your family will be shamed. And your little boyfriend will be marked forevermore as a priest's sore. Or you can be smart and go and get your stuff. Please no. I will wait in the car for exactly two minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Catherine Curlin began writing fiction just three years ago. And last year, um, her novel, A Dark Turn of Mind, was shortlist for the Daily Mail novel competition. And next year, it's coming out from Penguin Random House. It's a crime novel. We're all hoping it's going to turn into some huge, big series like, like a, a la Raymond Chandler or Inspector Barson, one of those things. But anyway, please give a hand to Catherine. the library and to Pat and Jennifer in the Munster Lit and uh, to, um, well, just kind of unbelievable to be here. Um, so, uh, and yeah, anyway, look, I, this is a, a, a story that was published in Quarrymen, as you know, and I don't think I'll read all of it, um, but I, I'll um, go as far as, uh, as I've marked anyway. Um, it's called Kitchen. In my defense, it was only the once it happened. But I keep thinking it's a sign of something more. It doesn't help that I'm reminded every time I'm in the kitchen. I'm browning meat for a casserole, and I reach into the press for the salt and pepper, and I remember. And I try to put it out of my mind, but I can't. And I snap at one of the kids, and they don't know why. And I keep trying to stop thinking about it, and I fail. They say the devil makes work for idle hands but I never had a minute, except for the time when Seamus was up in Mayo. We were keeping it quiet because it was to do with the pipeline, and you don't know where you're talking and who's in favour of the Shell to Sea crowd and who isn't. I'm half in favour of them myself, but Seamus said we didn't have a choice and I knew he was right. I didn't like him going up there all the same, with all the stuff you'd see on YouTube and the eco-warriors and the whole bog ready to blow in a gigantic orange burst of gas and turf if only anyone had a match. And if only Seamus had finished the job on the presses. It wasn't as if he was doing anything else most of the time. In fairness, he was collecting the kids from school, so we were saving on childcare. <clears throat> but I'd get in from work to find the four of them mouths open, waiting for me to tell them what we were having for dinner and what they were having for lunch the next day and where the PE gear was and where Seamus had put his monster jersey and, 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 and. I used to love watching him after he came in from work. He'd have hat hair after taking off the safety helmet. He'd fling himself on the sofa with the remote and shout comments over to me at the cooker, telling me what had happened during the day and how far behind or ahead they were on the job. I'd throw in an O or a Janie Mac to keep it going, but it was the look and sound of him I liked more than what he was saying. I knew it wasn't easy for him, going from up to 90 24-7 with the plant hire work 
the hanging lying around the house. The idleness got in in him after a while and he wouldn't talk about it, wouldn't retrain. I'm not depressed, he said. I'm temporarily unemployed. Which is depressing, I said. It might be, he said, except I'm not depressed. After a few rounds of that, I kept my mouth shut, did what I could to keep the family afloat, waited for him to get up off his fecking arse. But heading on for four years, there was no turn in the road, and I was racking my brains trying to think of something, anything for him to do. I hit on the kitchen. We could stretch to a paint job and new handles. Seamus was mad into the idea. We went to Woody's, a big Sunday outing, God help us, to get the supplies, and then to McDonald's on the way home. My card took a battering, but you should have seen the kids' faces. They were so easily pleased, it makes me cry to remember. We have three under ten, two girls and a boy, part of the lost generation of Irish smallies who, <coughs> who missed out on the trip to Lapland because their parents were too broke and too broken. I have to keep telling myself that they're nothing to do with this. When I got home from work on the Monday, Seamus had taken off all the old cabinet length brush steel handles. He'd be filling and sanding on the Tuesday, undercoating on the Wednesday, and painting on the Thursday. On the Friday, he'd put on the pewter effect half moon handles, and by the weekend, we'd have a new kitchen and a fresh start. He never got past the undercoat. On Wednesday, he got a call from Tony O'Brien in Mogili to say that he had a three day cash job for him. The kitchen can wait, Seamus said. It's an improvement already and it'll take no time to finish. He got a dribble of work as the spring brightened. Days here and there, nothing much. Then, four and a half months later, with the kids starting summer holidays, he got the month in Mayo. I stood watching him as he loaded up the van. Smiling he was with his sunglasses, those bug-eyed ones that I hate pushed up on his head. I hadn't seen them for a while. You could finish the work on the kitchen before you go, I wanted to say, but I bit the inside of my bottom lip and said nothing again. A few days later, I packed the kids off to my sisters in Kerry and did the final coat over three evenings after work. I used a ton of masking tape and stood back every so often to survey my handiwork. I found it relaxing. Seamus and the kids gone, John Creedon on the radio, the long, long balmy evenings, the patio door open. On the third evening, I sat outside on the sun lounger until it got dark. I noticed that my shoulders had dropped. They'd been up around my ears for years and that my breath was slower and deeper. I kept breathing in and out through my mouth, great lungfuls of, of fresh air, and I stretched out on the, long, on the lounger, my body long, feeling the blood come back into me, and I kept breathing, just breathing. When I came back in and saw my pristine, elegant, dove grey presses, I couldn't bear the thought of grubby, grubby finger marks on the paint. I swore I'd have the job finished before they came back. No bother at all. The parish was full of unemployed carpenters. But I couldn't ask someone we knew not to do something came, Seamus could have, should have done. So I went on the net and picked a name with no connection to the immediate lo locality. I'd go with the I wanted to surprise you thing. Seamus might sulk, but secretly he'd be delighted. He is Bob the Builder, and once he has his diggers and dumper trucks to play with, he loses whatever small bit of interest he has in domesticity. Anyway, I rang the carpenter the following morning, and he said that he was working near Killa, and that it sounded like a small job, and that he could call in on his way home around half six, if it suited. I said I'd text him directions and told him to ring me if he got lost. He laughed and said he thought he'd manage. He sounded like he knew what he was doing, and I felt myself getting excited as the afternoon went on. I was imagining myself sitting back admiring the handles, or them glinting after I'd given them a buff with one of those soft yellow dusters. The carpenter was a bit early, and he said he'd get stuck in straight away. I showed him the handles and where I wanted them, and he said, you're going vintage, I see, and laughed that easy laugh again. I went upstairs intending to change my clothes, but I didn't, and I came back down again and started working my way through a pile of ironing. Nice house, he said. 
And I found myself telling him all about the, the struggle to get planning and how in the end I wondered was it worth it with the cost of heating the huge echoey open plan rooms with the high ceilings and all the glass and us crippled with the mortgage though at least we had the tracker interest rate still but if we lost that we'd be in big trouble. Don't tell me but ask me he said. And his story was even worse because his wife had been made redundant and he was only scraping by with odd jobs now and then that he was delighted with. Don't get me wrong, he said, but they were on interest only and honestly, he'd love to drive up to bank centre and throw the keys at them. And I laughed and said, I don't do that. And he laughed as well and he kind of gave me a look and I looked away, but I looked at him again and he had turned back to the job and I was disappointed. We stayed quiet after that, but all the, all the time I could feel a tingle on my skin and a lightness in my belly. And I thought about how there was something familiar and different about us in the kitchen together. I thought about Seamus and the way things were between us. And I looked up again and I knew that it was the same for the carpenter and his wife and that he knew I knew. I'd say he had the job done in about 40 minutes and it was perfect. He only charged 30 euro and said, and I said, holy God, wouldn't he take more? But he wouldn't, and then I said that if I ever had another job, he, he'd be on the top of my list. Not that I expected him to charge so little the next time. And he said, are you calling me cheap or something? And I laughed again. And when he was gone, I had to go into the front room for a sit down. After a while, I remembered the iron and went into the kitchen and unplugged it. I smiled as I passed the cupboards and thought how silly I'd been with the carpenter, even though I hadn't felt silly exactly. I stopped for a moment, closed my eyes and leaned back against the worktop. I wasn't thinking of anything, but I felt myself drifting away and I had to put my two hands behind me to steady myself. I held on to the edge of the worktop and I could feel the edges digging into my palms. I heard my phone buzzing and for a second, I didn't know who the text was from, and I leave it there. Mary Morrissey is author of three novels, Mother of Pearl, The Pretender, and The Rising of Bella Casey, and two collections of stories, A Lazy Eye, and most recently, Prosperity Drive. She is the Associate Director of Creative Writing at University College Cork, a member of ACE Donna, and among her many accomplishments, she beat me for a Hennessy Prize for short fiction back in 1984. <laughs> Not her fault, Molly Keane and uh, Mortimer of uh, Humphreys Bailey person was, were judges at the time. I was 19 and uh, spoke me now for a second, right? <laughs> I was 19, the two judges said they were fed up of Irish writers writing about childhood, and I said, well, what the hell else am I supposed to write about? But Mary Morrissey wrote a brilliant, brilliant story that went to Lazy Eye, and the Mo Molly Keane and Mr Mortimer made the right decision. <laughs> news to me, by the way. I had no idea, Pat. Um, <laughs> uh, before I start reading, I just thought I would say a few words about the Quarryman Journal, because it comes from UCC, is run entirely by the students, by the English Society, and I see in the audience the editor, I see the person who illustrated the beautiful cover. I see several um, contributors and I see the typesetter. So it's one of those kind of projects where everybody is involved and it's a very democratic thing. And hopefully if this event becomes maybe an annual thing, it would be nice to see the students up here because there's some wonderful contributions in, in this journal. I urge you to go out and buy it for their contributions as much as for ours. Um, I'm going to read a, a sort of a, a, an edited version of the story that appeared in the, uh, in the Quarryman. And um, I don't, I, I, I write a lot of historical fiction, but I tend to think of the short story as not being a kind of his, 
not, not a good vehicle for history, but in fact I broke my own sort of rules here. And uh, this is about um, a crewman on the Titanic. And one of the difficulties about writing about the Titanic is that everybody has Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet in their heads mm -hmm. and, you know, out on the prow of the ship. And it's actually very hard to write anything that kind of escapes that kind of Hollywood image. Um, and I came across on Google or Wikipedia or something um, uh, a little piece about the man who saw the iceberg. And his name, I mean, you couldn't make this up, his name was Fred Fleet. I thought, perfect. And so, and the other thing about Fred Fleet was that he committed suicide at age 77. So a long, long time, he survived the Titanic, long, long time afterwards, he committed suicide. And, well, I thought, are the two things connected? Uh, the Habits of Ice. Fred Fleet unfurls the rope skywards. It stalls in a question mark, then snags on the fork of the post that stands like a mast in the night. He tugs once, twice. Yes, that will hold. He looks up. The sky is muddy, moon bullied by cloud. With difficulty, he clambers up onto the rake lid of the coal bunker built onto the gable of the dunny. The yard is puddled from earlier rain. He feels the cold in his veins, the ice in his joints. Soon he will be aloft, legs wheeling and juddering in the dance of death. He will be past tense, an old man who did himself in. That's what they'll say. Couldn't live without the wife, unbalanced the set of his mind, they'll say. And then, with her hardly cold in her grave, didn't the brother-in-law give him his marching papers? Threw him out on the street. Never got on, those two, and without Eva between them, poor Fred was lost. That's what they'll say, but they'll be wrong. Eva was his bulwark against the yawning chasm of another night, cold as this, that has come back to claim him. Cold as a witch's tit it was, no moon and dead calm. Kept your eyes peeled all the same. Down below you could hear reveling, hallooing, boots hoofing on board, someone's birthday. Wouldn't half mind, Lee said. You knew what he meant. Wouldn't half mind being down there with them instead of here, he meant. Perched halfway to the heavens, blowing on your perished hands, cold to the touch as the bars of the cage that hold you. You and Reggie Lee on lookout, like a man and wife in a honeymoon bed, second night out, and you've been paired for life, as it turns out. He don't talk much, suits you. Last thing you want is chitter chatter when you're scouting for growlers. They give out a glow, Lee said. First you see the froth, the waves licking at the base. That's how you recognize them from afar, like the hem of a petticoat, he said. You remember that. They say they can be blue, Lee said, by ways of conversation, but you didn't answer. You was the senior man, four years in the oceanic, you. You stared straight ahead, damn near blinded with concentration, and saw nothing at first. Just a haze. A haze is all. Happens when a berg rolls and the wet ice from down below comes up, gives off less light. You knows that now. Everyone is Solomon after the event. The habits of ice how it sucks in light during the day, then throws it off in the night, fooling you, fooling everyone. Ice blink, they calls it. Blink of an eye, that's all it took. Just after seven bells, 50 feet of glass reared up high as the forecastle head, enormous, opening its jaws on the prow. You watched and were dumbstruck. Before, there had been nothing. There's never nothing on the sea, Fred, lad, but you'd had sworn to it. You did swear to it on the Bible at that bloody tribunal, there being nothing one minute and then the next. You struck the bell three times. Hey, Lee protested. He'd seen nothing neither, but always wanted to be in on the action. If you'd have known what was to come, you'd have said to him, here, you ring the bridge, you say the words. But Lee was slow. 
So you fished the key from the hook and opened the box where the telephone was stowed. Fleet, you said, crow's nest, no response. You ploughed right on, speaking into the seething silence while in your ears a strange rumbling grew like thunder doused in pain. Iceberg, right ahead. The words out, you felt the world lurch, the telephone still in your hand. Bows coming round, Lee <coughs> shouted at you. A hard as starboard, as if your words were a command. But that couldn't be, for the ship moved before you'd finished speaking. Next thing you felt it, the groaning judder. You heard the crackle on the deck as if God were empty emptying a champagne bucket, like you'd seen the liveries do in first class. Thank you, a voice came back from the bridge. An officer, they all sounded the same to you. Thank you, as if you was delivering a bouquet of flowers, not reporting the gape of blue death, not like anything you'd ever seen. An iceberg, solid as a cliff, but filmy too, so you could see right through it. A thing all at odds with nature. In your bowels, you felt its grinding jaws. And then what did you do? That's what those admiralty boys wanted to know. You stayed at your post. It's what an able seaman does, you told him. Everything you said sounded stroppy when you was only stating the case. You could tell they thought you was shifty, hiding something. You thought it was a near miss, a close shave is all. You kept staring ahead. That was what you was paid for, five pounds a month and five shillings for the crow's nest. You stayed at your post until Hogg and Evans came on at midnight to relieve you. But the truth is, you was never relieved. And then what did you do? Out on the port deck, Lightholer ordered you to launch the number six boat. You and the quartermaster filled her. There were maybe 30 of them, ladies mostly, and Hitchens put you on oars with some major fella who said he had a yacht and knew about the water. Some ladies in the boat wanted to go towards the ship, but you were aiming away for the light. What light? There was a light on the port bow, another ship you thought come to help but it seemed to move as you pulled for it like the light in a nightmare. Or maybe it was a ghost ship. And you never reached this light? You shake your head. Didn't you hear the people crying? You was howling yourself, of truth be told, but it couldn't be heard above the din. What people? The people in the water. But there was no people in the water then. And when they were, you was too far away to hear them. And did you not go back? Back to that? The ship cracking in two, the water swelling around her carpets, devouring her. Go back. You'd had your fill of their questions. Didn't I see it for you, you wanted to shout at them. Isn't that enough for you? Mr. Fleet, you looked at them, all ranged against you, the sharp fellows in the suits, the chaps with the epaulets. Is there any more likes to have a go at me now? He saw it, saw it first and then went on seeing it, or braced himself constantly to see it. Two months after, he was back on duty, lookout on the Olympic, but the White Star Line didn't have much time for the likes of him. He was a reminder of someone who'd seen too much. He handed in his papers and switched to the Union Castle steamship, served till 36, then came ashore. But still, there was no rest. Even on dry land, he was always on vigil, always on the lookout for obstacles, for shadows on the horizon. He didn't fret about people on the street behind him. No, it was what was ahead that troubled him, what might loom up. He wanted the narrow, hemmed-in comfort of Norman Road, the safety of houses. They took your picture on the Carpathia. Some factotum shoved you up against a wall and chalked a number over your head, as if he was a criminal as if you'd done something wrong. You can't look at that picture, your cheeks stoved in, something dead in your eyes. Maybe they was always dead and you only noticed when the bulb went all seethe and sizzle, the diamondy chill of the sulfur flash, dead with the toll of all the things that might have been. If there'd been a moon, if they'd given you binoculars, if you'd shouted louder, if there hadn't been ice in your lungs, he unlaces his boots, holes in his socks. Somewhere he hears Eva tut-tutting. He peels them off and throws them and the boots to the ground. 
his bare feet numb on the corrugated roof. Discomfort can drive a man to courage. The moon comes out from behind its cover, a porthole in the inky sky. He feels like he's at the bottom of a well, but this time there's an escape hatch, the rope his way to gain the light. He dons his necklace of hemp.